And we have three guests who are more than willing to air their views on all football matters. In studio tonight, Brian Kerr, Stewie Byrne and a man who hit the net nine times during his Republic of Ireland career. And I think Clinton Morris is a young lad who is very, very raw, Bill. Uh, but I think in time he will prove to be a very good player. Fit in for Morrison. Clinton Morrison scores. Morrison. Morrison has scored. Unbelievable start for Ireland. An exquisite goal. Clinton Morrison. Yes, we're delighted to welcome Clinton Morrison to the Soccer Republic studio this evening. Clinton, some wonderful memories there uh, in the Republic of Ireland shirt. Before we talk about your time in the Irish jersey, people haven't seen you over here for a while, so I'm sure they're wondering what you're up to right now. Oh, right about now, I'm just looking for a new club. I'm, I'm training at Port Vale, so something might come there, but I'm keeping myself fit. But no, I'm just looking for a new club and doing a bit of media work at the moment. Yeah, and we're delighted that you've decided to do so and that you've uh, come over to join us tonight. Tell us about your time with the Republic of Ireland because, uh, you know, very topical at the moment with the UEFA campaign, the Euro campaign just starting. Uh, first, how did you earn your call up? Well, I had my call. I was playing. I kept um, when Mick McCarthy was in charge. I kept telling Taft, someone who knew Taft, his assistant, that I was eligible for Ireland. But they never came back. So <laughs> I just carried on. I carried on playing and scoring the goals for um, for Palace. And then Mick approached me one day, and I meant I had a meeting with him, but I turned up an hour late. But he didn't take it out on me. He took it out on my <laughs> agent. So I nearly didn't play for Ireland. But no. And then the rest is history. I had a choice. I could have. I got called up for England and turned to Ireland. But as soon as I. I met Mick, uh, Mick, he sold it to me and it was brilliant. And I'm 100% I'm Irish, I loved it, it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah, from talking to you prior to the programme, I get the impression that you really did enjoy your time with the Republic of Ireland and with the players that you met during that time and the players you played with. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I met, I met some great players. I played for some very good managers, one to my left, obviously, here. But no, it was good. I, it was brilliant. The lads were brilliant. They welcomed me straight away. and. It was just, it's a, it's, a boy, it's a boyhood dream, to be fair, to go and play with some top players like, obviously, Robbie Keane, Damien Duff, and obviously, the man himself, Roy Keane. So, it was brilliant. Yeah, tell me your view on Roy Keane, because I think a lot of people would be interested to know the, the type of guy he was within the Irish squad. He was good, and no worries with me, to be fair. He could be a bit intimidating, but obviously, <laughs> that's Roy. Roy's, Roy's Roy, but no, he was, a, he was a brilliant footballer. He set very high standards. He knew what he wanted, and he trained well, and it was trained how you play, really. And he was good. If you're a youngster like me, you could go and talk to him. Some days you couldn't probably talk to him. But, <laughs> depended but, on his mood, Depended on it? his moods, but most days you could talk to him, and he, and he was brilliant to have around the camp. Brian, you uh, had uh, Clinton in the squad many, many times and gave him many of his 36 caps. Uh, was he a good lad to have around the dressing room? Yeah, he was uh, very popular, I think, among, um, among the, the other players. Um, he, was, he was boisterous and uh, funny <laughs> and uh, good humoured. We used to question things at uh, times <laughs> in the nicest possible way. But mo Got some important goals But the most important mm. thing was he, he delivered on the pitch regularly and he worked really hard for the team, got some vital goals for us, both home and away. And um, he was probably a bit unlucky not to have scored even more goals and got more caps, I think. Yeah, well, Clinton, we're delighted to have you with us this evening and we'll talk a little bit more a little later in the programme. But time now to look back on events in Tbilisi yesterday evening as our qualifying campaign for Euro 2016 got underway against Georgia. Yes, well, the uh, Georgian goal was rather good, but the two goals that really mattered were those by Aidan McGeady, the second one, a really spectacular strike that earned us the three points. Now, Brian, you were in Tbilisi at the game. There were reservations expressed about the way the midfield three operated yesterday. Uh, what was your view of it? Well, I was surprised, first of all, at the selection. I think it was a good move by the manager not to tell anyone before the match because around the media uh, area, the discussion was what the team would be. In the Trapatone year, we were all told the team the day before, right, as yeah. were the opposition. So I think that was a good choice by the manager. We were surprised he played a uh, formation that he hasn't used in any of the previous eight games he had, uh, using Glenn Whelan as a holding player in front of the centre-backs and James McCarthy and Stephen Quinn right and left of him. So we, it, it was different. I don't know how much work they'd put into that on the training yeah. ground, but it did appear at times that they weren't quite sure of their roles. 
I, I thought Quinn and McCarthy worked very hard to try and get up and support Robbie, but they weren't available to take passes from Glen Whelan often enough. So I, I just felt that there wasn't a fluency about our midfield play at times, and we were depending on um, the right side of midfield, in particular with Walters and Coleman, where they made a lot of avenues through the defence in the first half and at times McGeady but McGeady and I understood Roddy, Ronnie's comments McGeady had had a very mixed second half a lot yeah. of opportunities breaking down them his crosses getting blocked and they defended against them really well I, I, I thought it was different I'm sure there was a, um, a part of the manager being a little bit conservative because he said first away game in the group, needing to get the, the three points, but most importantly not Lewis. And that's why he obviously went for that formation. Uh, Robbie was probably too isolated and wasn't a great figure for crosses when Walters got into good positions, McGeady, Coleman at times, not yeah. Stephen Ward. OK, uh, Clinton, we've mentioned Robbie a couple of times there. Uh, and people are of the opinion that possibly Robbie playing as the sole striker isn't his ideal position, as it were. No, I don't think it is his ideal position. Robbie's not a man who likes to play with his back to go. He likes to drop in the hole, get on the ball and make things happen. But sometimes you have to play him because I don't think you can leave Robbie out because yeah, he's yeah. a man who can pop up and, and get you a goal in any situation. So, obviously... You can talk about it, but they got the result and they got the job done and, and it worked out. But yeah, I did watch, I watched the game and, and he was isolated a lot. I'm up front by himself, but I think McGeady, as, you, was, as Brian was saying, yeah, he was a bit quiet in and out, but he's got that X factor and, have, and McGeady, he's got great ability. And as you saw with his second goal, if someone like Messi was scored a goal like that, you'd be talking that for weeks and months. It was a great goal. Clinton, we will be talking about <laughs> yeah. it for weeks and months, believe me. <laughs> well, he's an exceptional player. When he first came into one of the squads, he, I could see he's got that X factor and he started the season well at Everton, this season scoring um, a great goal. So... It'll be an important player for Ireland in this campaign. Yeah, we spoke about it last night, Stewie, that it'll be important to see the manager show faith in players, flair players, like McGeady, and indeed maybe at a later stage, maybe in the home games, Wes Houlihan. Yeah, you'd like to think so. Um, it's looking now like he, 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 he rates Wes Houlihan, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he wouldn't have played him so many games in the build-up otherwise. Um, he may be earmarking him for the home games, we'll, you know, we'll wait and see. Certainly, the relationship he has with Aidan McGeady brings out the best in Aidan McGeady, as we, it was in, fairly in evidence yesterday. Um, going back to Robbie Keane, I felt that, in, especially in the first 15, 20 minutes, I was actually quite, it was thought we started quite positively. And yeah. I thought there was an attempt, there was a game plan in place to try and kind of bridge that gap between um, Robbie Keane and the midfield. We had Walters and McGeady looking to get, get inside, looking to join up with Robbie Keane so he wouldn't become that isolated figure. Um, ultimately, the goal came from Route 1, but we had players up and forward, and you look at the way McGeady took his opportunity, he was world class, especially his second goal. The worries would be the second half performance. We kind of went into our shell a little bit, um, looking at Ocrius Philly and Jealous Philly. They were a real handful for Georgia, and um, caused us a little bit of trouble in the second half. And they're the things you, I, I suppose you can work on. But ultimately, when you've got Aidan McGeady playing the way he is at the moment, um, he's going to be a huge player for us in this campaign. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, the most important thing was to get the three points, and it's a positive start for the Republic of Ireland in Group D. The next outing is, of course, on October the 11th at the Aviva Stadium when we take on Gibraltar. Time uh, Clinton, I know you haven't seen too much of the league in, in recent years. You've seen some of it tonight. And, uh, we've had an interesting tweet, and it's a question that crossed my mind uh, earlier also, uh, about yourself and your future. I know you're uh, in negotiations with Port Vale at the moment, but the question has come in via Twitter. Uh, would you consider a couple of seasons in the league? Yeah, definitely. Um, after watching a few of the games and seeing them today, um, it looks like it's a good standard, and it looks like there's some really good football and some good junctures in there. And obviously, you've still got the likes of Stephen McFowell, Colin Healy and Keith Fahey playing are all still top players and who probably can still do it back in England. So, um, yeah, it looks like it's a good level and if, some, if a good opportunity came for me to come and play for one of the teams over here, I would definitely think about it. Well, uh, I don't know how many of the league managers have your phone number at the moment. If they have, it's sure to start ringing straight away, but, or no else they'll be looking for it over the coming days. <laughs> Clinton, thanks for the moment. Okay. Well, the Mark Noble debate was put on the back burner while we had the actual football to focus on. But you don't need to be reminded that many English-born players of Irish descent have worn the green jersey with pride and distinction in the past. Well, on Wednesday last, the Soccer Republic cameras were at Lansdowne Road and got various views on the Mark Noble issue. <laughs>
Pass in there, and it's come through here. Back it's here! Maybe it was slightly different than me and, and Mark Noble um, today and, and back then when I was sort of wanted to play for Ireland. I always wanted to play for Ireland. I mean, I actually was given the opportunity to play for England. Um, Jimmy Armfield asked me to represent England. Um, and the week later, Jack Charlton asked me to represent Ireland in a full international here against Russia. And um, although I found it an honour to be asked to play for England, at the back of my, my mind and my heart really wanted Jack to, to make that phone call. I think we look at it from face value, he's a good player. Of course, we know he's, he's played very well in the Premier League over the last 10 years or whatever it is, but there's a lot of issues for me personally, you know, growing up in England, desperate to play for Ireland and knowing what it meant to so many others in my situation as well. It doesn't sit quite right with me knowing that he is still keeping us waiting. He's been keeping us waiting now for a number of years. That's been probably my issue regarding it as well. It's, uh, it's something that we, we kind of like a last resort in many respects as well. And there's a lot of players that would, uh, would run through a brick wall to, to pull on the shirt for us. And that's my probably big issue that I have with it all. Stockton. Cascarino up. Oh, it's there! And Tony Cascarino has saved the day. I think it'd be difficult for him to now to, all of a sudden, if he doesn't get called up for England, then to all of a sudden say he wants to come and play for Ireland. I think people might, might find that um, a bit difficult to accept. It's not club football. You can't play for one nation, then choose another. That's what I, I believe in. I understand when the lads are 15, 16, 17, and they're playing for a nation, perhaps because that's where they've been selected for that nation and overlooked for, for who they would want to play for. But I think once you get to the 21 level and you've, de and you've decided, look, that's my team, that's who I'm going to play for, then all of a sudden you're switching allegiances to another nation. It doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me at all. I, I just don't think it's, it's right, certainly at international level. Yes, well, Kevin Kilban there, Stewie, making a very interesting point towards the end, that once you get to 21 level, you've pretty much made up your mind you're an adult, you're capable of making your own decisions, and it's understandable players getting caps at youth level, then maybe changing allegiance, but once you get to 21s, would you be of the same opinion as Kevin Kilban? I would be. I actually think what Kevin said is, is, is exactly the way I would feel about it. Um, I think it's very evident what he's saying, that... You, you look and listen to a player of his, you know, his experience with the Irish team, and he's saying that it, he would feel uncomfortable with it. I think he's kind of given a little bit away there as to how maybe some of the current Irish players would feel about it as well. Um, obviously, playing for Ireland is a, is a it's a, it's a huge honour. Um, it's something that the players yeah. take very, very seriously playing for their, for their country. Um, I, it doesn't sit well with me either. I think the fact that he's played at a, um, for, for England at an under-21 level, you know, he was, he's. He's old enough to make up his own mind. You know, trying to, I've been of the opinion of trying to switch now. I, I don't agree with it at all. And you also have to look at the fact, is it to the detriment of a, an up-and-coming young player as well? You know, that's a huge issue for me as well. You know, is he as good as... Is he playing particularly well at the moment? So, you know, I don't know. Is he as good as a, a Richie Towell? Is he as good as Richie Towell could be in, in two or three years' time? So that would be the issue for me. Yeah. The, the acceptance issue has to be considered as well, Clinton, because, uh, I mean, a player has to be embraced by the dressing room, as it were. And do you think there might be difficulties for Mark Noble to be welcomed into the Irish fold the way you were welcomed into the Irish fold? Yeah, I think there'd be difficulties now because he's it's been going on for two years. You know, he's, he's been arming and arming and I know what the boys are like. They'll accept you as, as soon as you make that decision, as soon as you declare yourself, yeah, you want to play for Ireland, they will accept you. But it's a great bunch of lads there and... Every, the team spirit is brilliant, and I don't, I can't see no reason why he wouldn't want to come and um, yeah. play for Ireland or declare because um, the fans, the public here, they're brilliant and they're passionate about their football. So it's a no-brainer. But obviously, if it's if it's taking him this long, then it will take. I, I think it would be a big decision if he does come because I don't know how many other players will take to it. No matter, he could be an exceptional player. You have to want to go and play. For yeah, your and the thing is, you know, there yeah. are many, many players. All of the players, one would suggest, in that Irish squad who absolutely have huge desire every time they pull on that green jersey. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I went into it and I was this young boy coming from South London with a bit of a, an attitude and they put me down to, to size, all of them, people like Niall Quinn, Steve Stoughton, Kevin Kilbane and, and all of the big players that were there and you've got to adapt and you've got to listen to the Irish music on the way to the, to the <laughs> ground and now I know all the Irish music and everything. So it was brilliant, um, but you have to adapt. I, I can't really see... The way Mark Noble is, he looks like a proper Eastern boy and a proper Londoner. I can't really see it. And because it's took so long and these two years to sweat out, I can't really see 
most of the lads accepting it. That's my honest opinion. I might be wrong, but I know how it works. Yeah, well, Brian, you're a man who's been in that hot seat and you've had players come into the, the squad of Irish descent and it has worked well. But uh, what's your view on the Mark Noble situation? Well, I think the whole situation is complicated since FIFA changed the rules. I think they're far too loose. But if you look at our group in this particular competition, Germany have exploited the fact that they've a huge yeah. immigrant po population around Europe, but the Turkish mainly, and taken advantage of that. Poland have had a Nigerian-born centre-forward playing in the senior international team. Scotland have been taking um, English-born players, plenty of them, and they're checking on the eligibility of, of players all the time for their underage teams right through. So I think a manager is under obligation, if he's doing his job properly, to look at the people who are eligible to play. But my rule would be they have to be better than what, what, what you have okay. who have been there and available and have come through the system. If they're just the same and they were sitting on the fence about playing for you and wondering whether they were going to be picked by someone else first. I wouldn't really go that road. I had to at one time, I, I picked Jonathan Macken because we were sh so short of options up front when you, he wasn't always fit <laughs> that I, I was looking for other players. He had played for England uh, under 20, but he, at that time he was still eligible to change for us. He only played one game, he wasn't quite good enough. But if you're short in a position, a manager's entitled to use the same rules that everyone else is using. I yeah. think in your heart of heart, when you know when you should know what you want to do. And if it's been, all right, I could take, see it taking a month, two months, but not two years. It's, that's dragged on a bit too long. If you know what you want to do, you should know after a couple of months that you want to go and play. I think that appears to be the general consensus, Clinton. And although we haven't heard from uh, Mark Noble just yet, so that story hasn't reached a conclusion just yet. We got to move.